So there we have it. Carlos Sainz is your first non-Red Bull race winner of the 2023 F1 season. Last night's Singapore Grand Prix was just incredible. Surely the best race of the season so far. And I think it was all quite easy to forget just how awesome Formula 1 can be when we have a multi-driver, multi-team fight for the win, and that's exactly what we got in Singapore. And if you'll pardon the very obvious pun, the signs have been visible for quite a while now. It seems like there's really been a change in the confidence in his side of the Ferrari garage. His pace across practice, qualifying, and race sessions has all experienced a real uptick and really kind of put him in that team leader role over what we all thought was going to be Charles Leclerc's Ferrari team. And for a while now, the team owners, the marketers and the strategists have all been accused of preferring Charles to Sainz. And it's a little bit like what people think Red Bull are doing with Max, right? He gets better track position in qualifying. That means he gets preferential strategies. That means they tailor the car towards his development preferences. But we've seen that really, really flip around now with Ferrari in the last few rounds. Sainz was fighting for the lead, holding off Max and holding off his teammate in the closing stages of the Italian Grand Prix last time out. And now he's taken his win in Singapore. The Singapore Grand Prix marked the third time in a row that Charles Leclerc was beaten by Carlos Sainz in qualifying and in race sessions. And it used to be that qualifying, that was where Charles was magic, right? That was where he had the edge. But it doesn't seem like that anymore. And hopefully, it's a bit of a turn of the tables that encourages Ferrari to fall into that kind of Mercedes Red Bull paradigm with two really strong drivers pushing each other and really bringing the best out of each other to push the team forward. That's the good side of it, but the bad side of it could come out too, right? We saw it start to get around in Monza where they were both fighting, both kind of going over the limit of what a team principal would want in how hard they were racing each other. So coming off of a really strong showing in Monza, we arrived to Singapore, the high downforce track, and a bit like we spoke about in the last video, there are plenty of unique aspects to street circuits that make them kind of weird in setups and cause these really variable results. But arriving with the softest compounds in the range to Singapore, we thought it was going to be heavily influenced by tyre management and by performance in high downforce conditions, something normally people would think maybe the Mercedes would be really good at. Of course, everyone thought too, the Red Bull's just going to dominate this weekend, right? But that wasn't exactly what happened. And let me tell you why that was. Basically, Red Bull had really been using their floor to give them stable downforce across all track dynamics. But as we spoke about in the last video, the camber, the bumpy surfaces, and the overall negative aspects of street surface racing forced Red Bull to raise the ride height of their car. And doing so kind of exposed a weakness because that stable downforce was taken away. It meant that the front and the rear wing, the side pods were more delivering that overall downforce pressure, making the car less predictable over bumps, making it less predictable under braking and not giving Max the confidence he needs to be able to catch that oversteer on the exit to carry that minimum speed and to draw out the lap time. We saw them complaining throughout practice, throughout qualifying about not having that feeling right. Seeing Sergio Perez spin out under low speed was a real sign that it just wasn't the drivers making the mistakes, it was the car being in a really, really poor window. We saw Max move a little bit forward, of course, finishing P5 in the race, but overall, it was a really brutal round for the Red Bulls. We know they'll be coming back with a vengeance in Japan, but this week, it's all Ferrari in the headlines. And what was really cool to see as well for Ferrari was not just them getting lucky with the setup or their car favouring the track, but them getting the strategy right at pretty much every stage, apart from that little error with Charles Leclerc's stop. Starting Charles on the soft tyre was a genius move as it allowed him to get past George Russell in the first few corners and then Ferrari could control the pace from there. This then meant on a track where the undercut was predicted to be so powerful on a high degradation race like Singapore, no one could actually do that undercut because they couldn't get out into a clean window on track. So we know Ferrari brought their best to this round, but so did Mercedes. We saw them talk about after qualifying how they'd brought an extra set of medium tyres into the race to enable them to play this kind of alternate strategy. A bit like we saw before, maybe in the Spanish Grand Prix with Lewis and Max, kind of a two-stopper v one-stopper strategy where you go onto a softer tyre, try and make back up the distance of the pit stop, plus some more, and allow you to have those fresher tyres at the end of the race. And that's what both Mercedes did as they were charging forward, giving us that four car fight for the lead right on the tail. It was another bit of kind of chess match intelligence strategy brilliance from Carlos Sainz that enabled him to keep that victory working together with his old teammate Lando Norris, keeping Lando in his DRS window, pulling him along, then making it harder for George Russell to overtake, causing George Russell to push so hard he found himself in the barriers brutally. Uh, Lewis Hamilton not having the time, of course, after that crash to make it back up to the lead. Finishing third, good result for him, moving him to third in the championship. But overall, a really great round for Ferrari, for McLaren to a huge haul of points, while Aston Martin are falling back and Mercedes had one driver in the wall. 
So moving forward then to Japan this weekend and the rest of the season, the seven races that we have to go this year, the problem is regression to the mean works in both directions. Red Bull were performing at an extremely high level this year so far. They fell back. They went kind of back to normal and even below that, leaving the gap for the other teams to fill in in their battle for the lead. But they're going to bounce back, they think, even on the simulator. They said that Singapore was going to be weak and that Japan was going to be really, really strong. And they're coming back with a vengeance. They're going to be like Michael Jordan. They're going to take it personally and they're going to try and smash the field by a massive margin. They're going to push the durability components to their limits because why not? Because they need to change the narrative from the team that fell off. It was noted, I think, in, uh, in Ted's notebook, the Sky F1 show, that all of the Red Bull were owners, the family from Thailand, were in Singapore watching the race, watching the race where Red Bull broke their win streak. Really, really brutal to do that in front of the investors. But what you can do at the next round is show that you're down, but you're not out and come back and smash the field. So what did you think of the Singapore Grand Prix? Was it the best race this year or are we kind of grading on a curve thanks to a bit of a boring year overall? And what action do you think have we got left in the season this year with the next seven races? Let me know down in the comments. But for now, thank you very, very much for watching. Please make sure to check out Crash.net for motorsport coverage from our team of writers across the racing world. And I'll be back later this week with another video previewing the Japanese Grand Prix.